This week I, I looked up on Amazon. I just simply typed into the, the search bar on Amazon, DIY books. 60,000 plus returns came back. Now, as I, I went through, say, about 10 of those pages, I quickly realized that not all of them were actually do-it-yourself books. There was, like, do-it-yourself coupon books and a whole bunch of other things that I'm not quite sure would fit under that DIY picture I had in my mind. But still, a whole lot of books. And my guess is you could probably come up with the titles of a few of them, right? There were do-it-yourself home repair books, a hundred different things you should know as a homeowner. There was soap-making books, but there were a few that I had never heard of before. For example, there was one called DIY Lithium Batteries. You could make your own lithium battery packs. DIY Crafts and Projects, that didn't sound anything too exciting to me, for your Instapot. Do-it-yourself poodle clippings and grooming. Again, things that I would have never thought you'd have to have a book to, to describe. One of the more popular types of, of websites, category of websites these days, is called life hacks. Right? And, and there'll be an entire website listing different entries about how you can make your life more efficient, little shortcuts you can take to, to make life easier. My guess is, even if do-it-yourself things around the house or just in life in general aren't your thing, you still like being able to find those little life hacks that make your life easier and more efficient. Which is why today's gospel lesson is dangerous for you and I as children of God. Because we can listen to Matthew's account of Jesus' temptation and walk away with what, what, Matthew and what, what, what Matthew records and what God wants me to learn from this is a simple how-to, a do-it-yourself way of overcoming temptation. And if we do that, we miss the most important part. We, we miss the most important thing in, Je in Matthew's account of Jesus' temptation. Because that's not at all, all, why God had Matthew record Jesus' temptation. So as we jump into that account in the Gospel of Matthew, in the back of your mind be thinking, what is the most important part? Why is it that God had Matthew record this little section of Jesus' life for us? Matthew picks up in, in chapter 4, right after Jesus' baptism. So you remember Jesus had come to the, the, the Jordan River, right, in, in the southern part of, of, of Israel, down by Judea. He had been baptized by John in the river, right? You remember that the heavens opened up, the dove, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove. The Heavenly Father spoke, right? He said, this is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And right after that we're told that the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the Judean wilderness. Now, the Judean wilderness is exactly what it sounds like. It is a wilderness. It is not like a place that you look and go, oh, this is a place I want to go vacation. It's brown, it's rocky, it's hot, and there's no water. And so the Holy Spirit leads Jesus out, we're told, to be tempted by the devil. Now, in your minds, as, as you think of this, Jesus leaving that, the Jordan River and heading out into this, this forsaken wilderness, don't think in your minds that this is the first time that the devil now is going to try and disrupt God's plan of salvation. That this is the first time, suddenly, that Jesus is being tempted. Jesus has been tempted for 30-some years already. Nor was this the last time that Jesus was now, or the devil was going to suddenly now give up on tempting Jesus. That was going to take, go right up until the moment Jesus gives up his spirit and dies on the cross. For his entire life, the devil was tempting Jesus. Why? Think of the devil's goal. The devil's goal was to wreck God's plan of salvation, right? 
The devil's goal was, if I get Jesus to mess up, God's plan of, of saving those creatures that he, he, he wonderfully formed and created is out the window. So the devil isn't going just to take these, these few days shortly after Jesus' baptism and say, well, if I can't do it in these days here, I probably won't be able to do it. It's why we heard, we hear in the, in the book of Hebrews that Jesus was tempted in every way. During his 33 years of life, the devil was throwing his entire playbook at Jesus, tempting him in every single possible way in hopes of getting Jesus to slip up. So we're told, right, the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He went 40, he was fasting 40 days and 40 nights. So you can imagine after 40 days and 40 nights of not eating how you'd feel. I believe the term that Snickers may have coined is perhaps accurate, hungry, hangry. Because how is it when, when you are hungry? Oftentimes we get a bit angry. We, get, we have a short fuse. Our, our patience goes out. We get annoyed at the easiest things. And so you can imagine during those 40 days, the devil was tempting Jesus. And with each passing day, what was Jesus getting? Weaker and weaker and weaker because he hadn't been eating. When does the devil find it easy to tempt you? Right as you walk out the doors here of church? Or when you're tired and worn out and exhausted? And fighting just another temptation is a lot. So 40 days of temptations, 40 days of not eating, and now it seems to culminate, as Matthew records for us, Jesus um, was, was there, he was hungry, and the devil comes to him and he says, if you are the Son of God. Remember the words we had just heard at the end of chapter 3 at Jesus' baptism, when God the Father comes and he says, you are, this is my Son. And now the devil twists those words a little bit. He says, well, if, if you really are, the Son of God. Just tell these stones to become bread. What was at the heart of the devil's temptation? Not so much questioning Jesus' deity, but more tempting Jesus, if, if God the Father really cared about you, why hasn't he provided for you? Right? He, he says he's going to take care of every last one of your, your earthly needs, that, that this isn't something you need to worry about each and every day because God will provide. It doesn't seem as though God is really providing. He was trying to tempt Jesus to distrust his heavenly Father. And it just so happens that you're also the Son of God. You've got the power to, to fix that, don't you, Jesus? Your heavenly Father hasn't provided for you, hasn't taken care of you. Just use your power as the Son of God and take care of yourself. Man, doesn't the devil do that still today? Cause you to doubt your Heavenly Father's love and care for you? Perhaps it's not at the end of a long day that you haven't eaten and you're a little bit hungry, but any difficulty that comes into your life, what does the devil whisper in your ear? If God really loved you, why would he bring this hardship, this difficulty? Why would he bring this into your life? And what the, the heart of the devil's temptation is the same as what was at the heart of the devil's temptation of Jesus, right? To get you to, to stop trusting and the promises God has given to you, promises in which he tells you, I will be with you every single day of your life. I will take care of you. I will provide for you. I will protect you. And the devil is there whispering, trying to get us to distrust the promises God has given. And then we see the devil take Jesus to the temple, to the highest point. The, the historian Josephus said, 
that highest point of the, the temple that looked out over the Kidron Valley may have been like 450 some feet into the air. So it wasn't like this small little drop, but it was one where if you're standing at that, that highest point and looking down, it's a, it's a good fall. Right? And he, and he twists God, God's word and he says, well, don't you remember those promises of God? You just quoted a, a promise that God had given to me. Remember that, right? Where the, God will send his angels to guard and protect you. So why don't you just jump and trust the promises God has given to you? It's as if the, the devil was in a car in the middle of a snowstorm. Right? And if you're in a car in the middle of a snowstorm and, and you start to lose control, you might jerk the wheel one way and you're headed towards one ditch and as you're going there, what do you do? You jerk the wheel the other way and just as quickly, no longer do you have to worry about this ditch, but now you've got to worry about this one because you've, you're heading into this one. The devil goes from one extreme, right, of saying... You shouldn't trust God's promises to a misplaced trust in God's promises that say, in fact, you should jump off the temple and trust God's promises. Martin Luther described it this way. He, he wrote, If the devil does not succeed, us, succeed in robbing us of our confidence in God, right, trusting in the, and being confident in the promises God has given to us, he will go to the other extreme, and try to make us cocksure and much too daring. Right? In essence, he says, oh, you trust God. Well, why aren't you trusting him more? Then we hear the devil take Jesus to the top of a high mountain, right? Show him all the nations of the earth. He says, bow down and worship me, and I will give you all of this. The heart of the devil's temptation wasn't so much that Jesus would be ruler over all, but by, by bowing down and worshiping the devil, by giving in to the devil's temptation, Jesus would be given a much easier life. Just think, no more suffering. The death that Jesus knew was coming in which he would bear, not only, not only would he die, but would bear the sin of all people. Would face God's righteous judgment because he was the sinner now. That he would no longer have to endure that, that separation from God and his love. That he would no longer have to endure hell. The devil was giving Jesus an easy way out. The devil still does that with you and I too, doesn't he? Doesn't he? In essence, the devil comes to Jesus and promises him something that wasn't his to give. The devil comes to you and me. And he promises us things that he really can't give us. Right? Do this, and what will happen is that you will feel better or you'll be happy. This person did this thing to you. You know what you should do? Yell and get that anger off your chest and let them know how you really feel. Because at the end of the day, how are you going to feel? Oh, you'll feel better because you got that off your chest and you really let them know. And the devil throws those lies in front of us. And we listen. And we do it. And at the end of the day, do we feel better now that we've, we've done that? We've gotten it off our chest, or whatever it may have been. Not at all. He promises us one thing. And doesn't follow through. In fact, doesn't follow through because he can't give us what he promises. Think back to our first lesson. What did he promise Adam and Eve? <laughs> you won't really die. In fact, God knows that when you eat of the tree, you'll become like God. You'll know good and evil. And we're told that when Eve saw the fruit and knew saw that it was desirable for gaining wisdom, that she would be like God. She listens to the devil's temptation where he says, oh yeah, I can give you this. And as soon as she eats, and as soon as Adam eats, what do they realize? They know good and evil. But it wasn't in the context that the devil had, the devil had promised. He promised them one thing but couldn't deliver and where it ended up was at the end of the day 
enemy felt much worse because they didn't have what they wanted. Have you picked up on it yet? Going through and, and hearing those temptations of Jesus, have you picked up the most important part of why God has Matthew record this account? Matthew, God has Matthew record this account more of a something Jesus did for you than a how to. What did Jesus do? The devil comes to him and he tempts him and he tempts him and he tempts him. And Jesus responds with promises that God had given in his word. Through every one of the temptations that we hear in Matthew's account here, what does Jesus do? He overcomes. He doesn't stumble. He doesn't fall into sin. What did Jesus do with every single one of the temptations that, that the devil put in front of him for that entire 30-some years of his life? He overcame. He didn't give in. Right? The, in, in the book of Hebrews, we said Jesus was tempted in every way, just as, as you and I are. Jesus faced every single one of the temptations the devil would place in our path so that when you and I are tempted, Jesus knows what it's like because he's been there. And then the writer to the Hebrew goes on. Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. That's the most important part of Jesus' temptations. Jesus was tempted in every way, just like you and I are. And yet he didn't sin. Why is that the most important part? Because when you and I face temptation, what all too often happens? The devil throws his playbook at us and we stumble. We fail. We sin. At the end of the day, our conscience bugs us and reminds us of, of guilt and all the different ways we've let our, our Heavenly Father down, all the different ways we've let our family down, all the different ways we've sinned. And what we quickly come to realize is that to be perfect, to be holy, like God calls us to be as his children, is something that is so completely impossible for you and I. What you and I need in a Savior isn't a Savior who comes and tells us how to overcome temptation, how to deal with sin. What we need is a Savior who comes and does it for me. And that's what he does, doesn't he? Tempted in every way, yet doesn't sin. We, we call it Jesus' active obedience. Right? Everything Jesus actively did in obeying God's law in order to keep God's law perfectly for you. Because you weren't able to. Jesus keeps every last one of God's commands. He perfectly withstands and overcomes every last one of the devil's temptations for you. He does it so that he can give you that perfection. So that when he takes your sins away, he doesn't just say he lived perfectly for you as he, he takes his, your sins away and, and calls it good, but he, instead he, he gives you something to replace those sins. He, he takes your sin from you, and what he gives you instead is a perfect life. That perfect life he lived for you. So that as you stand before God, God doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see your failures. He doesn't see all the times you've given into temptation and stumbled and, and fallen. Instead, what he sees is Jesus' perfection. And we know what Jesus does next, right? He, he takes all that sin from you, all your failures, all the times you've, you've given in to temptation, when you've listened to the devil, he takes all of that, wraps it up, puts it on his shoulders, and takes it to the cross, where he offers the perfect sacrifice for you. 
And he faces God's anger over sin for you. And he takes the punishment that your sins demanded, death. And he dies for you. And then so that you could be absolutely certain that your sin is paid for, that there isn't any sin that's still left uncovered, or that that sin isn't in some way covered or taken care of, he rises from the dead to show the devil's been defeated, sin has been destroyed, eternal life is yours. He does it for you. Right? So that when you and I look at Jesus' temptation in the desert, the most important part is so much more of a for you. This is what he did for you so that you could be perfect rather than teaching you how to, for, how to overcome temptation. Now, as children of God, are we going to be tempted? Yep. Would it be nice to know how to overcome some temptations? Yeah, that'd be nice. At least give us a few pointers. Okay, when the devil comes and tempts me, what should I do? Oh, look, we can look at what Jesus did and how he overcame temptation. But was that the most important part? Not by a long shot. Right, we look at how Jesus overcame temptation and he teaches us, boy, when the devil comes when, and, and throws those temptations in our face and, and wants us to sin, boy, we, we turn to God's word, right? We go back to those promises God has given to us, which means it's absolutely crucial for you and I to be in God's word. Right? Each and every day on our own reading and studying God's word, having our own personal devotions, having devotions with our family. It means it's absolutely crucial for you and I to be in Bible class, reading and studying and learning and and hearing insights from our fellow believers. It means it's absolutely important and crucial for you and I to be here more often than we're not. Because this is the place that God feeds our faith, nourishes our souls, and strengthens us for those temptations that the devil is going to put in our path. It means we know the promises God has given to us so that when the devil comes, we're able to have God's word on the tip of our tongue, ready to respond. It means when the devil comes with his temptations that, that seem to be ready to just overwhelm us and I'm about to fall, I, 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 I run to my Heavenly Father in prayer. Lord, help me, strengthen me, protect me. And God answers. And it also means that in those moments when I give in to temptation and I sin, I know where to go. I go back to my loving Savior, the Savior, maybe not the Savior I wanted, who gives me a DIY crash course on how to overcome temptation, but I go to the Savior I need, the one who lived perfectly for me and died for me, so I can hear from his own lips, I forgive you. I love you. You're my child. And as we do that, we see that Jesus' temptation is much more of a for you than a how-to. Amen. Our Savior Lutheran Church is located on the south side of Birmingham off Highway 280. We are on Dunnett Valley Road, about three-quarters of a mile east of Treetop Family Adventure and Sports Blast. Our Sunday services begin at 1015 with Sunday School and Bible class at 9 o'clock. We welcome visitors and hope to see you soon. For more information, please visit our website at OurSaviorBirmingham.com. Click on Sermons at the top of the page for a copy of today's service folder. You can also find us online on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.